That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Sylvie's Love, the sophomore film directed by musician turned director Eugene Ash, which premiered at the 2020 uh, Sundance Film Festival in the US Dramatic Competition and will be released courtesy of Amazon Prime December 23rd, 2020. This was a lovely film. Yes. It is set in the late 50s, early 60s. Harlem. Harlem. Revolves around Sylvie, mm -hmm. played by Tessa Thompson. Mm -hmm. So when we first meet Sylvie, she um, she has like middle class parents. Her mom teaches like etiquette classes and is very much about like her daughter. Uh, she used the phrase like not speaking to men who are above her or so, below her uh, social standing. Basically, social standing, yeah. so she is sort of like being. Her relationship is sort of being arranged. Mm -hmm. When well, she got caught fooling around with a boy uh, who is serving in the military, so she's betrothed to him. So she meets while she's working at her dad's record shop. She meets a musician named Richard, who's played by Robert. Robert, who's played by <laughs> Namdi Asua. <sighs> So Robert is a charming, handsome man, and she obviously, he catches her eye. They develop a relationship during, it's like the summer, right? Yeah, he begins to work with her Because he starts working at the record store, so she sees him a lot. They develop a relationship. He is a very talented musician, a saxophonist. He's part of a band. The band uh, finds management and gets offered a gig in Paris. Mm -hmm. So before he leaves, he gets, he doesn't know this, but he gets Sylvie pregnant. And at the last minute when he, because he invites, Robert invites Sylvie to go to Paris, but at the last minute she says no and doesn't tell him she's pregnant with his child. So he leaves. We flash forward five years. Sylvie's married, mm -hmm. has a child. Mm -hmm. She happens to bump into Robert at a Nancy Wilson concert. At a Nancy Wilson concert. They attend the concert together. They have sex again. Mm -hmm. uh, she's smitten again. Mm -hmm. He is now a successful musician because the band he was a part of, part of is kind of blown up and he's back in town to record an album. And now I'm forgetting the rest of the story. <laughs> uh, well, her own marriage is failing. Oh, so her main thing is her career. Yes. So she become her goal is to become a television producer and she is successful. Yeah. But it's wearing on her marriage because she's not performing her like wifely duties, like being at home and taking care of the kid. She works as the assistant to, uh, is it Karen? Played by Ryan Michelle Bath, uh, who after kind of a tense interview hires her. Uh, and she's also black and she goes off to get married, right? And sh so then uh, the job is offered to Sylvie to uh, take in for producing the Lucy Wolper show, a cooking uh, segment that uh, Wendy McClendon Covey starts. So in. Sylvie's producing the show when her father dies unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. Who's played by Lance Reddick. And she sort of has an awakening and decides that she wants to be out of this marriage where she's not necessarily happy. So she separates. Robert, mm -hmm. living his own life, finds out about it. They reconnect again. Mm -hmm. And things are going well. Yeah. He, he's introduced to his daughter. There's, there's some awkwardness over that, of course. But he has issues because while he was a part of the band that was successful, this jazz band, he has conflict with the leader of the band. Mm -hmm. Dickie Brewster, they're the part of the Dickie Brewster Quartet. Over money, over creative sort of control. During the time when the band was popping, Robert was being offered like solo things, but he didn't take advantage of those opportunities. But once the band dismantles and Robert wants to go find a gig, no one's checking for jazz anymore. Times have changed. We're now in the 60s. Mm -hmm. There's mention of like Stevie Wonder. So music's gone in a different direction. Robert's not as hot. So now that he's back with Sylvie, he seems unhappy because now he's like a house husband. Mm -hmm. 
He doesn't like that. But he has a run in with like an old neighborhood guy who works for Motown and tells him like, hey, I can get you something. So they connect and over the phone, this guy says like, yeah, I got you a job in the band. Just come up to Detroit mm -hmm. or over to Detroit. So Robert tells Sylvie like, hey, I got this gig in Detroit. Let me go out there, get it all settled and let's move. And Sylvie says, yes. She's like, I'll leave my, like this job I work so hard for. I can get like an entry level gig at a television station out there. We'll make it work. But when Robert gets out to Detroit, that friend who said he got him a job is really like a janitor and was lying. Mm -hmm. He just said, oh, I was just talking that shit. I didn't think he's like, know. he said, everybody knows that I lie. Yeah, like, everyone knows I lie. I didn't <laughs> think you were actually going to come out here. So of course, Robert's devastated. In a similar fashion to how Sylvie didn't tell Robert about her being pregnant years prior because she didn't want him to have to choose between his career and happiness. He does the same for her, mm -hmm. which is very, as an audience, as the audience was very frustrating because he wouldn't tell her what was happening. He just said, I don't, like, we can't be together. So they separate, she moves on. Another character in the film is Mona, Sylvie's cousin. Played by Aja Naomi King. Who I really liked. Yeah, I do. She's kind of like a very like, politically active person. So throughout the film, we see her sort of growing in that role. And towards the end of the film, we see her like running some like, it seems like she's mainly involved in like voter rights. So she's involved in some uh, protest uh, or event in Washington, D.C. So she invites Sylvie. Sylvie goes for the weekend. And while she's in that hotel, she bumps into Eva Longoria, who plays the wife of Dickie Brewster. Dickie Brewster. And Eva spills some tea like, oh, yeah, the band was going to have like a reunion, but Robert couldn't get time off from the plant. That's when Sylvie learns that Robert did not make it as a musician. He's out in Detroit working in the auto manufacturing plant. So she sort of has like an awakening again and decides that like she wants to be happy with Robert. So she goes to Detroit to find him and they reconnect at the end. Happily ever after. There you go. Okay, the film's like the story's kind of complicated because there are a lot of pieces, but it's a very simple story, very yeah. familiar. Mm -hmm. So initially when I finished it, I kind of thought it was a little dry, but then you explained that it mimics the films that I've also seen from the 50s and 60s with similar, so the story feels very familiar, but I think that's what's kind of awesome about it is that it is elegant and simple. Yeah. Um, and it's just this love story really focusing around this woman who's trying to like find herself and find happiness on many levels. It, it very much feels like a studio women's, what they called women's pictures in the 1950s, uh, a, a, a studio melodrama. Very well done. Also for a film set in the 50s and 60s with a black cast trying to make it in like corporate America. And there's very little um, mention. There's only one scene where Sylvie's husband uh, is trying to get an, like an account from this white company and at like a dinner party, the, the wife of the white man basically admits like, we're only considering your husband for like, what would be considered affirmative action. And then Sylvie tells her husband, like, you know, they're bigots. That's the real, like the only real mention, but otherwise well, the also, story feels very sort of um, like it's in a bubble. And I liked that. Well, also her father saying like, can you imagine a black girl TV producer? Sure. I think that it's making a, a very clear point of saying that racism is reality, but it's, yes. not, it's not defining these people. No, so it felt very, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it, it feels very um, intimate. Yeah. And the word I keep using is elegant. My only sort of, uh, well, why don't you go down your list? No, no I mean, I, I think it's fair to say Tessa Thompson isn't your go-to or your favorite at all. Um, Even though she's in a Janet Jackson movie. She is. And you know what? Her The first time I ever remember laying eyes on her and for Colored Girls, that's a really good scene that she knocks out of the park, I think, um, where she's dancing. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, she is. So when you think of women's pictures from the 50s and 60s, of course, with all by and large starred white women, you know, as, as a gay man, I loved the aggressive women. I loved Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. and the, 
the uh, dedication at the end of the film for Diane, Nancy, and Doris, which to me meant Diane Carroll, Nancy Wilson, and Doris Day. That to me, that's what the template she's playing is a is a Doris Day, this a, an overall good person who makes more or less the right decisions and uh, li you know lives by the consequences of her actions. The character subdued, I think, as an actor, I think Tessa Thompson is a little too subdued for my taste. So I'm very lukewarm towards towards her. I think she fits this character well enough. That being said, the woman who played Mona. So Aja Naomi King is... Every time she was on screen, especially next to her, because she plays her uh, Sylvie's cousin, mm -hmm. my eyes went to her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I wanted her to be see, Sylvie. And you, you didn't see... So I believe Aja Naomi King was uh, robbed of a breakthrough because uh, she starred as Nat Turner's wife, Cherry, in Birth of a Nation in 2016. And by far, like, the most fantastic part of that movie is her performance and how that all went down with that film getting kind of more or less sure. shelved. Uh, she should have been up there with Lupita. She, this, that was an Oscar-worthy performance. Because Robert, who's this very handsome man and like a successful musician, he seems to be doing very well for himself. It just seems like he has his pick of the litter, so to speak. Sure, sure. And the fact that he's sort of fixated on, he's not overly fixated on Sylvie, but he clearly has a connection to her. It just doesn't seem, because he seems much more dynamic and um, vibrant than Sylvie. Sure. So I didn't quite get why he needed or felt the need to want to connect with her versus like a woman like Mona, it would have been very clear to me why he still held feelings for her over all these years. Sure. And that's my, my only gripe about the film. Well, I think it, I remember you commenting after we finished was that it seems like everything just happens to her, like this love, this passion, this her career, her career. Her. And, uh, but it, like, think back to all those movies. Though. Yes. And like, once you explained that, I thought this film was very well done. Like, and I like the story. Like remember Mildred Pierce, like, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, all of a sudden she has a chain of restaurants. Like, yeah. no, it, <laughs> all it, that happens off screen. In context, this film works very well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I was also impressed with uh, Namdi Asua, who uh, I didn't see Crown Heights, which was a 2017 film uh, that he starred in, but he was in the NFL for 11 years, played for the Oakland Raiders. So I think his transition to a Broadway and film actor is impressive. Is impressive. He, he does was, a very good job. He was job very in good, yeah. Um, Jemima Kirk is the French countess that seduces. Uh, is it Tony Bell plays Dickie Brewster? Uh, she's very good. She's good. She plays their manager. Yeah. Uh, I always like Lance Reddick, uh, who and you said it, and now every time I think see him, I think it like, he could be RuPaul's like older brother. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but I do like him. Uh, John Magaro plays their manager at one point, Sid, who's the one that tells him basically, you know, uh, that Jazz is Jazz dead, is dead uh, who's also really good in Kelly Reichert's First Cow, which came out this past year. Um, MC Light was apparently in this movie, but We I, looked high and low for MC Light and could not find her. And we talked to a friend that has seen this movie, she said three times, and I'm like, did we miss MC Light or? She must have been cut. Uh, yeah, she might, but she's in the opening credits. Her name is listed. Yeah, so weird. And, as, and then in IMDb it says she plays a character named Mickey, but. Maybe right. she's in like drag makeup. I like playing a man. I don't know. I miss it. <laughs> um, but, you know, coming off of, we had just watched this around the time I was rewatching Diane Carroll and Claudine. Claudine. Um, Tessa Thompson has an upcoming movie directed by Rebecca Hall, which I'm really excited about. It's an adaptation of a novel called Passing by Nella Larson. Nella, Ru Nella Larson was a, a black woman writer in the 20s. She only wrote two books, uh, Quicksand and Passing. And I'm very excited to see Tessa Thompson in that. Um, I don't know. It, it feels like a nice Harlem Renaissance, but uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, the, the production design, the um, the music is excellent. The, the music, the wardrobe. Um, I would actually buy this soundtrack. Yeah, it was really good. The song selections are great. What would you give it? Uh, I'd give it four out of five. I would give it four out of five as well. Anything else? No. Bye. Bye.